All right, guys. So we're back with another video, and in today's video, I'm going to be discussing a few things. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of depth in this video, but I'm going to try to cover the layering system as thoroughly as possible. I want you guys to at least have a general idea of what I'm doing and how I accomplish things while I made certain decisions, so on and so forth. So you'll see that. I have the pistol aiming and I have the rifle aiming and you'll notice that the pistol aiming when we're idle and we have the pistol aiming you'll notice he holds it with two hands this was actually a choice that I made uh, based off of based off of a number of things one of those one of the reasons why I did that is because of the idle animation. And so you'll notice that the idle animation has the left leg forward and the right leg is back. Uh, so that's important to note because whenever he, if he's holding the pistol out in front of him, it may look a little weird if he's holding, because n normally whenever you're holding a pistol one-handed. Uh, one-handed, if you're holding it in your right hand and you're pointing out in front with one hand, your right leg is probably going to be forward, not your left leg. And so it looks weird whenever you see that because it seems unnatural. It doesn't seem normal. So I decided to, to have them holding it with both hands it's in his right hand but his left hand is cupped over it to stabilize it while he's aiming and idle whenever you start moving it comes off the weapon and that's when he's holding it with one hand so that was a design choice i made uh, you can change it and, and in fact i encourage you guys to change this however you want and I, i'm going to give you all the information you need in order to do that. So let's just go ahead and get started on uh, covering this. So I discussed in my last video that I mentioned that I might have a kind of hack that you guys can use to get around that uh, hand placement issue. Now there is a slight problem with that. The way that they have this set up right here is they're live retargeting these. Now, my hand placement system, the way I currently have it set up, and I could change it so that it wasn't dependent on the weapon bone, but that was a choice that I made because a lot of the times, whenever you're making extreme poses with the weapons, sometimes you need that weapon bone in order to rotate the weapon or displace it in the hand during animation. So that's not really possible without some kind of bone that the weapon gets attached to. And if you're going to displace the, uh, a bone that the weapon is attached to that follows the hand, then you need the virtual bone to be based off of that weapon bone that the weapon is attached to and not off of the hand bone. So technically you could just attach it to a socket on the hand you could get around it that way you could attach it to a socket on the hand and i'll probably show that uh to you guys in another video and then just make the the virtual bones point from one hand to the other hand instead of from the weapon bone to the other hand and that would be a solution but like i said if you decide that you need to rotate the weapon in the in the character's hand during animation for whatever reason for example if you're doing a butt stroke to the head series the wrist isn't going to bend like that it's going to do funny things uh and so you need to be able to, to rotate a bone that the weapon is connected to in order to properly follow through with such an extreme animation so you won't be able to do stuff like that. You won't need. You won't be able to have animations like that if you did that. 
But anyway, I'll show you guys that probably in, a, in an, another video. So moving on, uh, I'm going to briefly show you this. So I, I did uh, do a test setup, and it does seem to work, but it's really not working. Uh, and this was as close as I could get it with the live, with uh, the, yeah. So this was as close as I could get it with the, the live retargeting. And you'll see that there are some problems. For example, right here on the pistol, his hand actually comes off. Uh, his other hand. And when he's aiming high, it almost completely comes off. When he's aiming centered, it, it, it kind of looks okay, but it's not completely on it. I am using that hack, that retargeting hack. One second, let me show you the rifle now. So I do believe I have that hack enabled. But even with that hack enabled, you'll notice that the hand completely comes off of uh, the rifle. And the reason why is because that hack method that, that I use, it requires virtual bones. And I cannot get a location off of this body right here that the hands are on. Because when you're live retargeting, the virtual bones don't get live retargeted. It ignores virtual bones. And I need virtual bones. I need a proper virtual bone location in order to make this work. So I'll, I'll look into this some more. There might be a way to get around that, but for now, it doesn't seem like there is. But yeah, there, there, might, there might be a way around it. Oh, we'll see. So. Anyway, I'll get back to you uh, about that, guys. I have one ideal. But moving on, I just wanted to explain to you uh, why, why uh, right now at least, you can't do it from live retargeted characters. But I do have one ideal that I just came up with while talking to you guys, actually, about it. So I'll try that later. So anyway, moving on, now we're going to talk about IK bones and virtual bones. I want to introduce you to them and explain to you something. So you'll notice under the hand L, we have these weapon bones. Like I said, during more sophisticated animations, you actually do need those weapon bones. Now, ALS used the IK handgun bone and they used it just like those weapon bones are uh, on this one. So used to, before virtual bones came along, it was more commonplace and it's still a little commonplace for these IK bones to exist on the skeleton. And what happens is they get constrained during, during animation, they are constrained to the animation. And what it does is it gives us a reference to where the hands should be so that if we additively apply something to the arm and the arm is offset from its current position, uh, for example, we apply a breathing animation. Let's just say that breathing animation uh, displaces the, the hand. Uh, we can exclude these IK bones from that displacement and then use IK to tell the hand to go to where that IK bone is. Virtual bones work the same way. So the virtual bones will be at the locations that the hands are on that animation. And if you get their location after you've applied an additive to the arms on your anim graph, then those virtual bones will still be in the same location they were for that for that animation. And the only reason this works is because of the, the way that we handle things on the animation graph. Otherwise, we would just be getting the post additive layering 
position. So if we go over here to the animation graph, let's say that let's say that he's holding it with his right arm, okay? And we apply an additive mesh space overlay onto this, and let's just say it displaces his hand, his right arm, okay? Now over here, right here, the overlay pose itself, the original unaltered overlay pose that has not had a mesh space additive applied to that arm, it'll have that virtual bone in the same exact place it was before we applied that. So what that allows us to do is it allows us to apply breathing and stuff like that. Like right now I'm applying breathing over this, uh, but their hands don't get displaced even with that breathing because of that method that I'm using for the IK. And right here, you'll see this right here. Now that effector location is only relevant for my hack. What my hack does is it gets the socket location. Uh, it gets the socket location on the weapon, and it. And also, I should mention that if you want to enable that, it's this boolean right here. Just check this boolean enable uh, procedural offset hack. If you enable that, then on the animation graph it'll start updating this effector offset location. So when this uh, is being called, what it'll do is it'll get the character mesh, it'll look at the virtual bone, hand L, of this character, and it'll get the socket location of the held object, and it'll make that sock. What it'll do is it'll find the offset of this world location from this virtual bone. So what, what we're returning right here is actually the offset. How many centimeters to the left, right, up, down is this socket from this virtual bone? So it's an offset. That's what we're getting. We're getting an offset, and then we're adding that offset to the effector to the virtual bone's current location, which effectively offsets the virtual bone inside of the anim graph uh, to be wherever it should be based off of that socket. And so this can update it in sync with the animation instance. That's a workaround that I found. So the reason why this doesn't work with the library targeting right now is because I'm getting this location from this mesh, not the library targeted mesh, because of the library targeted mesh is actually it's actually on a body down here. So they're using the copy pose, and I don't have it open right now. Here I'll show you. If I can find it. No, here. If we go to widgets and we go to game game animation widget and we open this up and we select this and we double click on this to open it up, you'll see this character right here is actually a child of this mesh right here. And and uh, this held object is attached to the weapon R bone of this mesh. Now we could create another skeletal mesh under here. And what I did on my other one is I actually had uh, I actually modified it. If we go back over to the main character blueprint, I turned this into a function, and I made this. And into this, a parameter that you have to uh, pass into that function. And then since this is the parent of this one, I went over here and I overrode that function here 
and instead of passing in this held object, I passed in the held object under the body for this character. And that one was attached to a weapon R socket, an O weapon R bone on this character. So that's how I got around that. Now, now as, as far as uh, adding the weapon R bone to it, there is a plugin. Skeletal Mesh Editing Tools, and it allows you to add bones to your skeleton. If you add bones to your skeleton, then you need to you need to create go to skeleton and create skeleton uh, off of this because right now it's sharing a skeleton with all the other metahumans. And if you add a bone to this, even if you don't change any bones. If you add a bone to this, it'll screw up the weights. It's a bug in the skeletal mesh editing tools. So you have to unshare, you have to make this so that it's not sharing a skeleton with anything before you change or before you add a weapon R bone to it. That's the breakdown on that. So I've got that out of the way. And I've explained IK and virtual bones. If you want to know more about it, I have dedicated videos to that. Now we're going to move on. Okay, let me just open up that. So if we go into under blueprints, you'll see that CBP sandbox character. That's the main blueprint. Uh, all those other ones are a child of this. You'll see inside of here, I'm just storing the weapons right now inside of a data ass or well, inside of a structure with the overlay state assigned to it and a mesh. So this is just setting this mesh, the skeletal mesh, to use a, me a specific mesh out of here based off of this. Um, index. That's how I'm doing it currently. That will likely change in the future. Uh, this is a community project, guys. So if you want to add to this, if you want to make uh, like a transition animation uh, for putting the weapon away, so on and so forth, and present it to me, if I think it's uh, appropriate, then I, I will add it to this. And I will uh, give you, I'll, I'll put you in the credits for, for it as well. So now we're going to talk about choosers and data, data assets. This is what drives the values for our layering system. I'll explain the layering system to you after this. So first we have our choosers. That's under blueprints, weapons, and you'll see a chooser right here. And if you open it up, you'll see that we have a, uh, a pistol and a rifle. And if you say edit, oh, also uh, this is being updated from the current overlay state. And how is that being updated? Well, we're storing the current overlay state right here, and that's being updated on the event graph inside of here. And it's getting that from it's getting that from the character that's being set right here. So once it's determined which one we're going into, you'll see inside of here we have these data assets. And you'll notice that the context data is referencing the animation blueprint. And its output type is a PDA overlay layering, which is the primary data asset that all of these data assets are based off of. If you go in here, you'll see the primary data asset right here. I'll go, I'll do a video later on how to uh, set up a custom overlay state and how to do all this for it. For now, I'll just go ahead and show you if we go into miscellaneous and we go to data asset, we can choose the PDA overlay layering, which is this one right here. 
and we can select it, and now we have a new data asset. And then you can come in here, and you can uh, start setting these up. After you've set that up, you can go to your chooser. Let's say that this is a completely new state. You would add a row and do a nested chooser. And then you can uh, select new ch nested chooser off of this and name it. And then you can press edit and it'll take you in here. Now you can uh, add a row asset. And now you're just going to select that asset and you're going to press this back button. And now that data asset has been loaded in here. You can uh, add your booleans and enums and you can reference them directly from the character. That's how that works. So where is this uh, chooser being evaluated at? I'll show you that now. So if we come back over here to the animation blueprint on the event graph under the update additive overlay, which I misspelled, I'll fix that later. If we go under here, you'll see that the first thing we do is we evaluate the, the, the chooser and we store that into a, a variable. And then we store some other things into some variables that we're going to be using often. And the reason why is because I don't want to have to do all of this every single time that I need to call these. I just want to be able to call a Boolean and not have to do any processing. That's the reason why I, I, I did that. Over here, I'm doing a validation to make sure that the current lay, layer settings has been assigned and that it's not invalid. And then over here, I am updating the layering values for these using this function, which will interpolate uh, the target layering weight automatically for us. So if it change, if the tar, if we change our, if the chooser updates our layering settings, then the new layering weight for say the legs might go from one to zero this will make sure that it doesn't snap from one to zero, causing a, a snapping of the animation on the, in the game. And so it'll interpolate it automatically for us. I have it set to a, a moderate value of 10, which is kind of like a mid-range value. It's not too fast, not too slow. You can adjust that if you want. And I'm just doing that for all of this. And I am doing this on a tick. Right now, I'm doing this on a tick for testing. Uh, in a later video, I might show you all how to uh, set this up so that it only does it as needed. But for testing, you're definitely going to want this on a tick. The reason why is because it allows you to, because we're using data assets and, we, and we're updating this uh, from the chooser on this tick, what happens is it allows us to it allows us to uh, change these values in real time while the game is running. And I'll just go ahead and show you that, and then we'll discuss that some. So you'll see right here I have a pistol ready state. It's a, it's a pistol idle ready state. This is the M9, and this is the M9 idle rest uh, data asset with all the settings for that. And if I check hand LIK, you'll see nothing really seems to uh, change on there. Oops. I don't know what I pressed. So it doesn't seem to change, and that's and the reason why is because the hand just isn't displaced, so you're not going to see anything. But if I set this for uh, the legs, and also you can ignore the layering weight for the legs. You'll understand why here in a minute. But the overlay space is what you're concerned about with the legs. 
but the layering weight only doesn't apply to the legs. For everything else, it matters. If you don't need, for example, I'll give you an example. Don't set this to mesh space. If this is going to be uh, zero, it just doesn't make any sense. That's not going to be evaluated anyway. Also, don't set this to base and then set it to 1.0 because that means that you're, you're uh, evaluating that layer for no reason because the base is the locomotion and without that being weighted, it's just going to play the locomotion on that layer anyway because it's not being layered if the value is zero. But it is, it is being evaluated if the value is one. So if you move your cursor over, you'll see I left some tool tips to kind of semi explain how this all works. So we have uh, the legs, it controls the stance. Mostly you, you're, you're only gonna really want to do this during idles or slow walks. If you do a fast run or a, a sprint or even a jog probably, what happens is say that the leg comes all the way back here uh, or comes back here and uh, off like that whenever you're in a sprint. If you apply a wide stance to this where the leg is back here, then what ends up happening is when the leg get, is supposed to be back here on the locomotion, it ends up being up here instead. And so you'll get this Looney Tune effect where the legs are coming way up here, maybe even a, maybe even all the way up here. So you don't want to you don't want to do that. It's just going to look stupid. So, so uh, yeah, just you have to be careful. If you do this, you only want to do it during idle. Uh, now some of these animations might be offsetting the character from the ground whenever you do this. I'll have to fix that later. Um, that was something I clone, I clone did that. And I would like to make these poses inside of Unreal Engine, but I need them to fix the modular control rig. Right now, if you bake an animation or a pose using the modular control rig, it screws up the entire animation. So as soon as they fix that, I won't have to worry about iClone offsetting this anymore because I won't have to use iClone. Uh, but iClone keeps screwing up the, the pelvis. It keeps offsetting it. So uh, I'll have to go back and, and, and try to fix that. I don't know why, why iClone keeps doing that. But anyway, so you'll see how the stance changed whenever I set changed this from base uh, to uh, local space or even mesh space. And if you do overlay, that's actually the pose of the overlay uh, that's playing right now. That's That lower body was meant to be a neutral pose. So if that was applied during running, then it wouldn't cause any problems. In actuality for the idle state, uh, we don't have to worry about, we don't have to worry if it's a neutral pose or not. Uh, so anyway. Moving on, we have torso. Torso controls, uh, you know, the posture of the of the pelvis and the spine. It also lowers the pelvis lower to the ground. So if I do mesh space and I do 1.0, in this case it raised it because he was actually standing higher, and also because of what I well, not because he was standing higher, but because I told you that. Iclone keeps offsetting the pelvis. Remember I told you that? I think that's the reason why. I'm going to have to go back and fix those. I uh, didn't realize it was doing that. Uh, and some of these, you're going to want mesh space. So, for example, on this one right here, this is a mesh space. Now, I did fix these. So, these won't, these shouldn't do it whenever you're in uh, mesh space. So if I go to the M4A1 idle rest and I open this up, you'll see that, well, the torso is set to mesh space, but it's set, okay. Yeah, I'll have to go back and fix that, guys. 
Uh, I'll have to fix that. It's offsetting them. That's why. That's what I hate about iClone. iClone keeps it always offsets the pelvis. It's really annoying. Like I like I said before, if you're uh, you can, I guess you can have the overlay space set to whatever. It doesn't matter as long as the layering weight is zero when you're not using it. But yeah, so that's somewhat of a problem. I'll have to fix that. I'm not going to get to it today, guys. I'll, I'll go back and fix it later. For the most part, though, uh, you're going to want to you're going to want the legs, torso, and head. You're going to want those to be in base, and then you're mostly just layering the arms. But during uh, during some situations, you actually do want the body to be applied in mesh space. But I'll have to fix those animations before we can do that. It'll look better once we do that, I think. But anyway, so the arm L mesh space and the arm R mesh space, it controls ac accuracy, accurate placement. And that's why I have these set to overlay with 1.0. And you can set the uh, local space one. Uh, under a different space and local ls mostly just means that i'm not applying the the i'm not blending in mesh the the rotations in mesh space on the layered blend per bone that's basically what that means but the ms controls accurate placement needs to be 100 percent during fast movements especially not necessarily all the time, but during fast movements, you do. For the left arm, because we're using IK, you're not going to really see a difference there. So you could actually, in most cases, uh, turn this off. Actually, let me make sure. So in most cases, you actually uh, can turn that off. But I think in this one case, I think it... Yeah, I don't think in this case it's important. So you can just turn that off. And you can probably Okay, the this one actually adds more subtle movement from the locomotion back onto it. So this one is important if you want it to be more uh if you want it to be more like the locomotion. So the higher the value of this, the closer it's going to be to the locomotion. Now you have mesh space and you have local space. It's not really important. You don't need to apply mesh space on the arms uh, unless you need accuracy. Uh, mesh space on the arms is only really used during aim offsets. For any other purpose, at least for the arms, you should probably just apply it in local space. And you'll see I can uh, have the left arm in overlay mode. And you'll see the arm is still moving, and that's because I'm applying a breathing over it right after the uh, this arm pose plays. A breathing additive is applied over it. But it's probably better if you do put it in overlay mode that you have it low around 0.5, and you'll see that the hand, the fingers and the hand is moving a bit more naturally, and so, do, so does the arm. But for this, I like to keep it in local space. You'll see it moves around more naturally because it's it's respecting the uh, movement of the locomotion more whenever we have it in local space. When you put it in mesh space, it it doesn't respect the movements of the underlying locomotion as much, and so it may come out looking stiffer, which is why on the arms. Most of the time, you want to apply it in local space.
So the lower this value, the closer to the actual pose, uh, the overlay pose, it'll look. So this is how it looks in the actual overlay pose with the breathing added over the top of it. And this is closer to where it would be at on the locomotion because I'm applying that at 100%. Same thing applies to the other arm. Now the hand, right now I'm only uh, doing a, a hand. Uh, no, I'm correcting both of the hands. So I'm not using this one though. Right here, right now, I think on the graph, I'm only using uh, the hand R one. So if I change this to, let's say, yeah, I think the effect of this is going to be pretty subtle. Let's check it on this one. You're going to, I think I, I might not have that one hooked up right there. This actually might only be affecting this one. Oh, no, I don't have that hooked up right now. Okay, just ignore that, guys. Uh, I don't actually have the this stuff hooked up. My bad. But, yeah, you'd probably want it to be overlay at 100% on both of them. Uh, well, on, on the one holding the gun. If it's if it's holding the gun, if it's a two-handed, then you want it on both. If it's a one-handed, you only need it on the one hand. I'll I'll fix that later, so that we can uh, change that from here as well. That basically covers this, though. Um, let me just go ahead and check that off. Now it's time to discuss the layering system. So I'm just going to go ahead and stop that. We're going to go over to the animation blueprint. So I've already discussed how the uh, layer settings are being stored, uh, grabbed and stored. Now we're going to talk about the layering system itself. So over here, you'll see I'm caching the motion matching uh, because we're going to be using that in multiple places. And each one of these is, is pretty much uh, the same over here on the left-hand side. What I'm doing is I'm grabbing that, uh, that data asset information that I stored, and I'm selecting, based off of that enum, I'm selecting which we're going to apply to this input. And this is why for the legs, the layering weight is not needed because for the base of a layering blend per bone, it's not actually affected by the blend weight. Uh, the second one and how much the second one is blended will determine, will determine that. So over here, you'll see that I have the I'm using a branch filter. It's easier to use a branch filter. It's more convenient. And it doesn't bloat this right here with a bunch of different masks because uh, we don't really need those masks and it's just as easy to use branch filters. So in some cases, masks can be uh, very important because they're a lot more flexible than uh, branch filters. But for the most part, it's not that important. Now, the thigh L and the thigh R, I have that set to negative one. I've went, I've went over blend depth uh, before in another video, but I'll briefly discover it. I mean, uh, go over it. So negative one means that we're going to ignore it. Zero and one means that the first bone in this uh, branch will be blended 100 percent and the reason why zero and one both do the same thing is because of the math that's behind it if we enter two that means 
For example, if this is the pelvis, that means the pelvis will be blended 50% and, and spine 01 will be 100% and everything under spine 01 will be 100%. If it were, let's say, four, then we have these four bones right here. Uh, pelvis would be 33%, spine 01 would be 66%. Spino 2 would be, oh, my bad. Uh, yeah, so it would be, pelvis would be 25%. Spino 1 would be 50%. Uh, spino 2 would be 75%. And Spino 3 would be 100%. And everything under Spino 3 would be 100%. That's how that works. So the, the mesh space rotation blend, if you read the tooltip, it basically says it all. Whether to blend bone rotations in mesh space or in local space. So that, that determines how, like what space will they blend these together. So in most cases, you're going to want this to be in mesh space. And I'm basically doing the same thing on all of these. I got the neck, the clavicle, the clavicle L, the clavicle R, and the clavicle R. So the the arms, you'll notice that one of these is in uh, is using a mesh space rotation blend, and the other is not. So the mesh, the mesh space rotation blend is going to be more locationally accurate. <clears throat> the, local, uh, the local space blend is going to be less locationally accurate. So if you use the, if you use it without the mesh space rotation blend checked, then it can offset things. That brings me back to this, actually. So on here, you'll see that I said controls accurate placement. If you if you do not do this first in mesh space before you apply uh, some of the subtle motions of the locomotion back onto the arms, if you don't do this first, then the placement of the arms will be offset. And I can show you that actually. So this is the M9 idle aiming. I'm just going to uh, show you this is where it is right now. Oop. So if I aim and I pause, I play and then I eject, then it goes back into playing, but it doesn't change the state. And I can come over here to the side and I can change this and watch and see how, how it uh, affects it. So I'll set that to zero. And you see how it got offset? That's because it's only being applied in local space over here. None of it is being applied in mesh space. So mesh space first places it properly, locationally. Uh, and then the mesh space reintroduces some of the subtle motions back in. But uh, it also offsets it somewhat too. You'll see... If I turn that off, then it's way over here to the right. If I say 0.4, it does bring it closer. If I say 1, it doesn't quite bring it back to where it's supposed to be right in front of the face. But the arms are moving a lot more now, as you can see. Uh, and so you can apply the local space to it. But you want, but you definitely want, while aiming, at least while aiming, you want it to be 100% in mesh space. And then you can apply just a little bit of local space to it. So you'll see, I, I had that set up to 0.4, but it actually offsets it quite a bit. So it's something to keep in mind. You can also apply that in local space or in mesh space.
and you can tell, see the difference between the way it holds holds it there. So anyway, if you do apply some of this back onto the arms, it's important that you only apply a little bit. I think on this one, I apply just a little bit too much. And actually, it looks a little bit more accurate right here now. For the For the uh, run aiming, let's see what I did on that one. Yeah, see, I didn't set that to 0.4 on that one. I set it to 0.2. Oh, and I have the left arm uh, in uh, playing base, but but on this one, it actually was important, I believe, to set that to one because I'm also applying uh, mesh space on this. Okay, maybe not. Yeah, so remember what I said. If, if you don't need it, don't set it to one because it adds to the performance hit. So, oh, I was aiming, okay. So I did need it. Okay. Yeah. So for this one, like I said, because I'm applying it in mesh space first, I do need to apply the base back to it. So now you'll see it adds that locomotion movement back into it while still respecting the way the arm was positioned and posed on that animation or that pose. Yeah. So anyway, this is really great to have it this way because now you guys can come in here and experiment and become familiar a hell of a lot easier than what you would have been able to do in ALS. So that basically covers the layering system. I'll try to break that down in more detail in a later video. I'm just briefly covering things in this video. It's already going to be fairly long. So. Over here we have our overlay state, and that's where the overlay pose is coming in right here on these. And that's a pretty simple one. So right here you'll notice I'm getting the state weight of the ready, and that's the state weight of this. So if we actually uh, play it, you'll see whenever he's in the ready state, we have a, a state weight of 100%. That actually equals out to be 1.0. Uh, so that's why if the if the state weight is greater than 0 0.9, then we can blend out of that ready state into the aiming state. And if we don't do that, then it might come out of the aiming state and then go immediately back into the uh, aiming state. And it, it can jump back and forth and get caught in a loop if you don't do that. So if he wants to aim and we're and we're mostly blended into the ready state, then we can aim. Over here, I'm uh, making sure that he is not within uh, the aim offset threshold, and he's not equal to idle. And if that's true, then that means we're doing a hard pivot, and we should come out of the aiming state. And I discussed this in the last video. If you go under the variables overlay AO, this AO max angle threshold is what uh, controls the angle at which this is triggered. And so that's 115 right now. So whenever he ex exceeds 115 uh, degrees while running and aiming, then he will come out of the aiming state. Otherwise, if he decides not to aim anymore, then he'll also come out. Now that brings me inside of here. You'll see right here, I'm applying 50% of the secondary motion in here, and it's just a breathing animation. 
So during the idols, during the uh, or during the rest state, I'm applying uh, fifty percent of that, and that's and that's why his arms are going up and down. Now, right here, based off the current overlay state, I'm choosing one of these. And so if you want to add a new one, you can right click on here and you can say pistol and it'll add a slot for the pistol. And that overlay state, I don't even know where that is anymore. Let's see. It's under weapons. It's in the root folder. It's the E overlay state. If you open that up, you can add more into it. Inside of each of these, I'm doing some logic here. I'm doing a two-way blend based off of the speed. I'm mapping the speed uh, here. And that the reason why I'm doing that, let's see. Right, so we have this zero, this point zero eight, and we have this point. Oh wait, no. Let me see. We're using point zero four and zero right here. So if he should move, then we're playing. We're overlaying the locomotion onto point zero four. This one right here, you'll see that his uh, legs, his feet are pointing forward. If his foot is pointing to the side and you overlay the locomotion onto it, then it'll rotate his foot off to the side uh, while he's running. That's why we need the feet uh, pointing forward and we need them in a natural stance underneath his pelvis, not off to the side. If we had a wide stance, it could cause problems during locomotion. I've explained this in my advanced animation series where I go over nuances of additives uh, and yeah so you can go and watch that if you're more interested so if he should move then we're in that stance then we're then we're in this stance but if he shouldn't move then we move over into this other stance and I guess there's not really much of a point in that. I'm not real sure why I even did that now, come to think of it. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, there might have been a reason. Um, oh, yeah, okay. So, whenever he's not moving, I just wanted the, I just wanted it to look a little bit more natural and that right leg is just a little bit back whereas the other one is they're pretty much even. So I wanted it to look just a little bit more offset whenever he was an idol. This is more pronounced on the rifle than it is on this one. So if he is not moving, actually, yeah, so if he's not moving, we're actually in this state. But whenever he starts moving, we're doing this, I believe. Okay, yeah, so the reason why I actually did this, did it this way, is to, is to offset the way that his, his hand is. I might have to go into that in another video. But I'm blending between these because if we just disconnect this, you'll see his hand is right by his side. So if you like that, that's the original pose. I'm actually blending between those two poses where his hand is up like this and where his... Oh, yeah, okay. I remember why I did that now. So the reason why I did that is because uh, when he's running with his, with his arm being bent that much, it, it just kinds of, it kind of comes out looking funny 
So what I'm doing is whenever he's not running, I don't want his hand completely down by his side like that. So I blend partially in with this one, which uh, makes it uh, look more natural to me. But it also allows me whenever he starts moving fast, it blends more into this one, but not completely. So his arm ends up like this rather than like this. And that's basically what the 0.9 and the 0.25 mean. It means that I'm not completely blending into this one when I'm not moving, but I'm not completely blending into this one when I'm moving fast. So if I'm moving 300 centimeters a second or faster, then I'm blending into this 1.9. Yeah, sorry about that. That was uh, something I, I did and completely forgot about. I wasn't real sure. So in here, it looks like I left some testing that I put in there. But this one's using something similar. It's using a similar method. Whenever he's between 100 and 500 centimeters, we'll blend uh, zero. Uh, zero means this one's completely blended. And 25% means that this one is blended 75%. And this one is blended 25%. And if you go in here, You'll see that's him uh, holding the rifle like this. And this one, it has him in a different stance. So right here, he's in a wider stance. Right here, he's in a... And also, remember, whenever we blend that torso and mesh space, uh, this affects it. Like I said, I have to go back and fix those. I believe... They're all messed up. Let me see. Yeah. So they're it's they're offset from the ground. And if we open up the animation actually, it may not be obvious at first, but if you come down here, you'll notice that they're actually floating. iClone did that. I am not responsible for that. iClone is offsetting the pelvis of everything that you bring in there. I don't know why it's doing it. Uh, I'll have to go back and offset the pelvis back so that the feet are touching the ground. Uh, I thought I'd fixed it. I might have fixed it on some of them and forgot to fix it on others, but that's something I'll have to cover uh, later, and I'll probably update it. Like I might fix that today and then and then go back and uh, either today or tomorrow I'll fix those and. Uh, I'll, if, also, if you want to keep up with uh, the updates on this project, you can uh, join the Discord, and you can come down here to server file updates, and I'll post the updates right here. All right, so I covered overlay states, and now the aiming. Oh, yeah, yeah. So let me uh, go over the aiming. I did not cover that. I only covered the armed, which should be called resting, actually, but whatever. Um, so let's just go back to the animation graph. I'll go back in here, and under the aiming state, I'm, I'm applying 25% of the breathing and the aiming state because we don't want it to destabilize the hands. We want the hands to be more stable whenever he's trying to aim. And inside of here, you'll see that we have this aim sweep right here. And again, if he's aiming, and he, but he shouldn't move, and I might turn this into a, a state machine rather than using a blend, poses by bull, I might uh, turn this into a state machine inside of here. But anyway, the point is, is that whenever he's idle, we're going to play this one. And when he's not idle, we're going to play this one. And we're going to apply an in-mesh space, an additive, which is an aim sweep. And I made these myself, actually, from scratch. And I made them based off of the, the idle pose, the first frame of the idle uh, loop that 
came from this project. And basically, I just made three keyframes. One keyframe on uh, zero where he's pointing down, uh, one keyframe on 15 where he's pointing straight ahead, and one keyframe on the last frame, which should actually be frame 30. I don't know why that. I'll have to fix that. That's another iClone problem. It keeps doing stuff like that. I don't know why. But anyway, uh, and then one frame on 30 where he's pointing up. And then I just linearly interpolated between them. You want to linearly interpolate between these frames uh, because if you don't, then it'll slow down and it'll speed up as it's moving away from them and slow down as it's reaching the next one. And you don't want that. You want it to be a constant rate. And you want these to be 30 frames long, which is one second at 30 frames per second. That's one second. And then inside of here, I'll show you how I'm calculating the, I'm, I'm manually driving this animation. And I'm driving it right here based off of the aim offset value. And I'm uh, clamping it between negative 90 and 90 since this only points 90 degrees down and 90 degrees up. When he's point, when it starts, he's pointing down, uh, which is negative 90. And when he's pointing up, that's 90. So we're mapping that from 0 to 1 uh, to reflect the animation. And that's why we have to, if we make these, we need to start at frame zero and we need to end at frame 30 and he needs to go from pointing down to pointing up i think als did theirs backwards uh from how i did it they started from pointing up and then they went to pointing down but anyway you know it's whatever you can also just reverse uh you can also just like maybe set the play rate as negative one or something uh, on here but i'm not sure that's going to work for this method So it could cause problems. So that's that part out of the way. That's how I'm pointing from up to down. Now, how am I pointing left to right? So I'll go over that now. You'll see also that when we're unarmed, we're, we're just playing it from the base. Otherwise, we're going to use the layered blend uh, method, the added dynamic additive overlay layering method. Again, if it's un if he's unarmed, if he, oops, if he's unarmed, we're going to uh, use the original aim offset logic. But if he's armed, we're going to manually rotate the spine. And right here, this is the weapon finger correction. I did have this as hand R, but I decided to just do it like this. So I'm applying it only to the fingers right here. And then right here, I'm applying the weapons after the default slot. So if you play a montage, the weapon won't come out of the end. That's the reason why I did uh, the weapon R and weapon L bone after the default slot. So let me go over this. Over here, this is a mess. Okay, I thought I'd fix that. Oh, that's just remnants. I was doing a lot of testing. Uh, so anyway, right here, you'll see I'm getting the spine rotation. Uh, I'm dividing it, I'm clamping it between negative 90 and 90 uh, because this value will go from like negative 180 to 180. And I'm dividing it by six, which is the number of bones I'm applying it to. Pelvis, spine one, two, three, four, five. So that's a total of six bones. That's why I'm dividing it by six. I only need the Z, yaw rotation, and I'm interpolating it. That's what's happening right there.
So on the aim offset value, I, this is what I had to do for the uh, look uh, left to right. For the, for the look left to right, I had to do it like this. And what I'm doing is I'm getting the root transform rotation. I'm making it relative to the character's world transform location. And then I'm inverting that by multiplying it by negative one, the yaw, the yaw of it. And I'm using that as the left to right. The reason why I did that is because the one that they were using, it, it was causing jittering. Uh, and well, also, whenever he starts rotating, it won't let him rotate the full 90 degrees. It's, um, I'd have to show you for you to really understand, but there was a specific reason why I had to do it like this. Just, uh, trust me on that. So that basically covers it guys. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Like I said, this is a community project. Uh, I, I welcome anybody to, uh, you know, pitch me ideals or if they want to contribute, feel free to contribute. I don't mind. And uh, I'll be doing more videos on this uh, at a later date. And I'll see you guys later.